There's, yep. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs. Dance like dying stars. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs. I can't run real far. Let me break down what I just said. Each of my double D's has the volume of a toddler's head. Now bitching about my boobies, they look super flying shirts. But if I swung them in your face, you'd be like, oh my God, that hurts. I'm blind, holy crap, I literally can't see. I have permanent retinal damage. I'm suing you and your heavy boobies. Heavy boobs, heavy boobs, dance like dying stars. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs. They each have their own memoirs. What you gotta know is that boobs may be where it's at. But if you cut them open, they're just sacks of yellow fat. Stuff falls into my bra. It's a little bit of a drag. But when I go to bed at night, it's like opening a Mary Poppins bag. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs. Dance like dying stars. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs. Don't need an airbag in my car. Here is a list of all of the objects that I can hold under my boobs. Stapler, 10 pencils, paperback copy of Arabian Nights, dog bone, remote control, hardback copy of Wuthering Heights. See, when a star is dying, it transforms into a red giant. And if the red giant does not have enough mass to fuse carbon, an inert mass of carbon and oxygen builds up in the center, transforming into a dense white dwarf. And yeah, like, that's my boobs. That's, that's what my boobs are like. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs, dance like a white dwarf. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs, they be a catch at Fisherman's Wharf. I got them heavy boobs, heavy boobs, don't ever forget that these heavy boobs, heavy boobs are just sacks of yellow fat, like the stuffing of a couch. They're just sacks of yellow fat, technically meant to feed a baby, they're just sacks of yellow fat. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Mondays at 8, 7 Central on The CW. Before you sit, can you show us how to do the heavy boobs? Thing? Oh yeah, so so the thing with heavy boobs is the whole key to it is hi everyone. It's um, I wanted it to be a boob heavy dance that was not sexy. I wanted I wanted to make it almost impossible to have a boner or jerk off to it. Uh, and so I told our choreographer Catherine Burns like make it boob centric but don't make it sexy. And so she did it. And then just to ensure it wouldn't be sexy, we got a bunch of literally. A couple minutes of me just moving my boobs around with a horrible look on my face. It'll fuck up my hair, but it's basically this. <laughs> it's that. I have too much support right now to really make it work. Uh, if oh, we had been, if we had like been a on nerd. a cable network, I probably just would have been topless. <laughs> and you would have seen my nips just like spurting milk in every direction. I'm not lactating, but I just think in that moment I would have spontaneously lactated. I like to think I so. I mean, I'm th happy When I'm Friday thirsty, morning. it would come in handy. <laughs> that was hilarious. Thank you. I'm very happy that you did that, because if I asked anyone else, I'm not sure they would have done that. So can we give her a round of applause? Oh. Thank you. No fear, and that's why your show has a season two, because the show is incredible. Thank you. Congratulations on season two. Thank I'm you. sure you're very excited. I'm very excited. Um, how about that move, though? You're moving to Friday nights uh, with the Vampire Diaries. I think it's great because, first of all, I want to encourage the fans to, like, have Friday night watching parties. Um, I'm really excited. I, I really want to have, like, a big, like, Friday night watching party at, like, a gay bar in L.A. <laughs> uh, I'm really excited for that. Um, and, you know, both of our shows, it's kind of, like, really, like, I mean, we're not really, it's paired with the Vampire Diaries, obviously, but, like, our show just kind of doesn't, pair with anything we're so unique on that network and so that Friday night nine is like a standalone slot and a lot of networks have been doing that lately using that Friday slot um I mean and, and, and found a lot of success with it um you think about like Shark Tank which my friends and I watch like every Friday night um so I think it's like a really unique opportunity for us to kind of like stand on our own and like encourage people to like make it a party to watch our show and we're also not competing with we were on Monday nights competing with like The Voice, Dancing with the Stars, The Bachelor, a lot of audience crossover with that. And so we get to kind of like stand on our own on Friday nights. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a great pregame episode party. A lot of people you guys said a lot of people said they they would someone said they pregame with my music videos anyway, and now they'll just like pregame with the show. I pregame with heavy boobs every week. See, the, the sad thing is when we have depressing episodes and you're just like, musical numbers, oh no, she's clinically depressed. Well, back to cocaine, you know. 
Um, <laughs> That's how we all pregame, right? <laughs> so tell me. <laughs> that guy gave me yeah, a that. thumbs up. <laughs> Cocaine and I've crazy never done ex coca just, I've never done cocaine. I just want to make that clear. I've never done cocaine. It doesn't matter. I think I'm very uncool for it. I just, I've never done it. That's good. I'm afraid of dying. <laughs> it's like a weird thing I have. I'm like afraid of dying. It's so funny. I'm so quirky. So original. Yeah. So tell me about going into season two and what are your hopes? Are you looking to switch anything up? How is the writing going? I know you're back in the writer's room. So how's that whole experience going down? Uh, it's awesome. I mean, the great thing about season two is I don't want to spoil anything, but like, oh, I don't really care. Uh, season season one, um, my character was all about being in denial about why she had moved to this town for this boy, and half of it was kind of her lying to herse her herself. And this season, we get to live in the idea that like she's openly in love with this person, um, which is so exciting because we can do things that we haven't done before. Um, and we get to take the show's premise to the next level. And yeah, we've, we've already, we're gonna have a new theme song. Uh, Cause the old theme song was all based on denial and that's not what this season is about. The season is not, it's still about self delusion, but it's not about the complete denial of why she's in West Covina. Um, and it's been really fun to get back in the room. Yeah, I think that's great that you're switching up your theme song. Cause who else does that? You don't see Game of Thrones switching up their theme song. Yeah, that unambitious piece of shit show, Game of Thrones. <laughs> What, what tired hacks they are over at Game of Thrones. Yeah, I, I just think we have this opportunity to do this show on network television, and I'm just so excited. We, we don't want to play anything safe. I'm so excited to continue experimenting. And, you know, I, you never, I never thought I'd say this about a show on broadcast TV, but I feel, we feel so creatively and artistically free. They kind of let us do anything we want. Um, and it just, it feels like every day is like a playground, especially in the writer's room. Um, I mean, those days just go by like that. And we're excited to just keep having fun and experimenting with the medium. Yeah, what's your favorite part about going to work every day and, and you know, getting to, you, coming from sketch comedy and being in that background. I know you went to NYU too, so yeah. call up for NYU. Um, Tish? No, no, one. They all just love Tish. CAS? None of them went. Galton? Steinhardt? Stern? <laughs> All right. I'm done. <laughs> How did you kind of bring no. your background in sketch comedy to the show? And were you, like, so shocked that your show got picked up? Because it must be the best feeling in the entire world. Yeah, I was shocked. We had a, first of all, we had a pilot with Showtime that got passed on, and we sent it to every other network in the world. Um, what's great is that you, we had a dead pilot, and all of these people go, oh, my God, you know what you should do? you should send it to Netflix. And it was like, we never thought of that. Thank you for that idea. Netflix, what's, net, what's a Netflix? Uh, we literally sent it to every single network there is and everyone passed on it. And so I thought my show was just, I thought it was a dead pilot. And then um, we, uh, my, my co-writer saw Jane the Virgin and was like, maybe we should try CW. And we sent it to CW and we, a week before Upfronts last year, we got ordered to series. So it was all very unexpected. And as far as sketch comedy, I mean, the musical numbers on this show, I see them as musical sketches. Um, I'm one of the main songwriters, and I usually, um, I script most of the songs. Um, and the way that I script the songs, I script them like sketches. It's very specific, to the point where sometimes it's like between, you know, one minute and 27 seconds and one minute and 29 seconds cut to this joke, like close up on this. And then, so it's, it's very, very, very specific in the way that you would do a comedy sketch as opposed to a music video, which is kind of made in editing, you know? Um, we're not experimental with the editing unless the genre calls for that. So what do you write first? The uh, songs for the episode or the episode? Episode. Fill it in. It, 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 it's the plot of the episode has to come first because we're doing a musical and we're doing a classic musical in that we want the songs to be emotionally earned and also give you an emotional insight that you wouldn't have normally from the text. So we don't wait for the episode to be done. Um, like I started, I just started working on the songs for episode one kind of simultaneously with us writing the script for episode one. But we have to know what the plot is. And did you always know you wanted it to be a musical show? Yeah, it started as a musical show before we even knew what the show was gonna be. Um, my co-creator saw my, she's a very successful screenwriter. Uh, she wrote The Devil Wears Prada, 27 Dresses. She's wildly successful and she's a genius, Aline Brosh McKenna. And she saw my music videos online. I'd been doing music videos online for years. And 
I get an email saying CBS and Aline Brosh McKenna want to meet with you to discuss a musical television show. And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have anything that day. I'll cancel my fucking dental appointment. Um, and so I, I meet with her and she was like, I want to create a show with you. And then she was like, you know, I had this movie idea, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And I was like, great. Because because every, all of my music videos were about this person who was kind of... Um, uh, delusional and sad and kind of overcompensating with being optimistic and, and happy, which is basically the the warring sides of myself as someone who is really into like Disneyland <laughs> and like musical theater, but also someone who thinks about death. Um, so it's nice to combine those. That's perfect with a musical, you know? Perfect. You go from the happy, happy, happy dramatic dance sequences to the very, very sad melodramatic scene. <laughs> Precisely. It's pretty perfect. Exactly. So did you kind of look to a Glee or a Nashville or the other musical shows to be like, how can I do this completely differently? Because your show just stands out amongst the musical-esque TV shows that have come before you. Yeah, you know, no, I didn't. Um, I looked to the musical theater canon. I looked to the music. I looked to musical theater to tell me how to write this show and, and how do you put musical theater on television? Um, you know, Nashville, th th that's a show about the music industry. Um, I've never seen Nashville because I'm horrible. Um, no, it just got canceled. I know. I'm really behind on television in general, um, <laughs> especially in the past year. Um, too much to watch, though. There's just it's too much to fault. watch. And then Glee, uh, different tonally. D the, the two things that differentiate us, well, a lot of things differentiate us between us and Glee, despite the fact we actually have a lot of overlapping crew, Michael Hitchcock, who worked on Glee, uh, is on our show. Um, our uh, our AD, Roger, uh, was the AD on Glee. But um, shout out to Roger if he's watching this. I don't know if he is, but if he is, he's great. Um, he's a surfer. Eh, you don't care. Um, uh, first of all, Glee only did covers, and we do original. Ev every song we do is original. Um, last In the first season, we wrote 49 original songs. Yeah, um, and the second thing is that Glee kind of always was in this heightened state, and something we were interested in doing is having the musical fantasy sequences really, really contrast with reality. So as much as possible, we try to, as, as, as crazy as the premise is and as crazy as we go, we, we try <clears throat> to play with the contrast between reality and fantasy, and that's why we do a lot of improv on set, because improv, not only do we get some of our like best jokes from, from the improv, but also it creates a looseness that simulates naturalism um, as much as we can on a musical sitcom. And so how did you go about casting? Because I'm assuming you wanted everyone to have a sort of musical theater background or at least be able to sing. One second. <laughs> I know, both of us are like, ah, it's like Friday morning. I'm tired. I've been in New York, you know, five hours of sleep. Um, that's, well, you guys are in college. That's nothing to you guys. You guys are going to class on like one hour of sleep. Um, the by the way, that's the one that's the one mistake I made at NYU. Get more sleep. It's just get more sleep. I was getting five hours of sleep sometimes before, like, I spent eight hours in a conservatory musical theater class. It was horrible. Um, what was your question? Casting. Casting. Yes. So here's the thing. The only role we went in knowing how to sing was the role of Paula, played by Donald and Champlin. Everyone else, because we didn't know what to expect. We wanted the best actors for the roles first. And we were willing to craft around people's musical abilities. So I like, in the back of my head, if the person playing Josh could rap, we'd make him a rapper and that would kind of be his vocabulary, almost. you know. Or if the person playing Greg was like a kind of singer, songwriter, guitar player, like great, that would be his dialogue and vocabulary. Um, and what we did was we, we had kind of, for the first four weeks of casting in the pilot, two casting directors working, one out of LA, one out of New York. And we found a lot of our series regulars out of New York. And what happened was they were the best actors for the roles who then were amazing singers. I mean, especially in the case of um, Santina, who plays Greg, and Vinny, who plays Josh. Those were roles that they didn't need to be. We would have hired them. Their auditions were so good. We would have hired them if they couldn't sing a note, and we would have worked with it. And then Vinny and his audition, it's funny. We said um, in our audition breakdown for the role of Josh Chan, um, Please, uh, you know, audition with some sort of musical ability, um, i.e., rapping, singing, playing guitar, etc. But Vinny, being the most talented person in the world, took it literally, and he rapped, sang, and played guitar in his audition. Oh my God. He accompanied himself on guitar and rapped and sang. We were like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> you're really talented." Plus, he's an acrobat. He has two black belts. Uh, he's made his profession mostly as a, a dancer in musical theater. 
Um, so we can do any genre with him. A case in point, the first number he's in is a boy band number in which he plays all the members of a boy band, which you can only do with someone as immensely talented as that. And then Santino, um, I watched his, we watched his audition and he was amazing. And I'm like, oh, what's this guy's, and this was before I realized he was Hans in the movie Frozen. I was like, oh, I wonder what his audition's gonna be. And it was him standing up, singing, accompanying himself on piano. And I was just like, all right, we get it. You're talented. <laughs> Everyone was just came in and blew us away. And then I remember um, we were screening um, the pilot. There's a siren. This is, the, is the building on fire? I hope not. Well, are we going to try and go shirtwaist factory this shit? We should just go down with the ship. We'll just break out in song and act yeah. like nothing's going on. Yeah, that's because that's what they did at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, and it worked great. <laughs> worked amazingly for those young immigrant women uh, who died. R.I.P. Um, if you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, the fuck was your question? <laughs> oh, we were on. Oh, 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 and then Donald. Lynn. So, so um, first of all, everyone auditioned for the role of Paula was fantastic. I, I really think we could, the amount of talent out there on both coasts for women in their 40s and 50s, every single woman who auditioned was amazing and could belt their faces off. There should be, every TV show out there should be for, like, women in their 40s and 50s. They are by far the most talented demographic ever, and they all need to be famous right now. And it was so hard to cast that role. Um, Donna Lynn, for her audition, sang This Little Light of Mine a cappella. And I remember when we were screening the pilot at Showtime, she has like the greatest voice in the world. And she's like, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And we played it, and then we stopped it, and I said to the Showtime execs, and that's what talent is. <laughs> Like, saying, like, no one else that I was talented. I don't know, but I was just so smug about Donna Lynn's talent. <laughs> anyway, uh, everyone who auditions for this show, there are so many talented people in the world who aren't famous. And there are quite a few t famous people who aren't talented. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, with the amount of people out there who are talented and not famous, I don't think there should be an excuse for someone to be famous and not be talented. Um, yeah. um, and the other thing that's great about our set, we're such a family, and because everyone on my show comes from theater or comedy, everyone is so grateful to be there and game to do anything. And you hear about these sets, and I don't know if this is like more of a film or TV actor thing, or this is just like a pretty people thing, if you're only casting pretty people, I don't know, but like, um, not that the people on my show aren't pretty, they are, but like, um, but, but you hear about like, oh, that actor won't do this on set, or, or that, that actor is, Oh well, I won't. I won't. I'm afraid to do this. I, there is no such thing as fear on our set. Um, and if there was, they would be recast. <laughs> yeah. But that's why you had no fear, and you won a Golden Globe. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you beat out a couple. Uh, you know. It's you know it's so funny. Someone asked me like, who did it feel the best to beat? And I was like, Meryl Streep. I mean. Come on. No, I did not beat Meryl Streep. One day, uh, one day. I did, I, no, I'll never beat her. If I'm ever in a category with her, she can take it. Um, there should just be an Academy Award for best Meryl Streep in a Meryl Streep at this point, because <laughs> she's in like another category. Um, uh, do you know that at the end of The Devil Wears Prada, fun fact, because my co-writer wrote The Devil Wears Prada, the very last line of the movie is her going, go to the um, limousine driver and uh, that was a stage direction. It's like it was like Miranda looks at the limo driver, and the subtext was go, and instead she just go like improvised, it and it was great. Um, apparently, she's a man magnificent, magnificent improviser. Fuck. <laughs> um, the fuck was your question again? <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> you beat out so many. Right. There's yes. no. It's not. Look. It's not beating out. There's, I take no pleasure in the idea like beating someone out. I am honored to even be on a list with those people. And that Golden Globe got us a season two. So it's not as much of like beating out other people as like what an amazing thing to get this award and for it to, in essence, be able to save the jobs of the 230 people who work on my show. Um, and the day after I won, I brought the Globe to work and we set up a podium in white, the White Feather offices, and um, we all posed with the Golden Globe. And, like, the great thing is, like, it was so special to me, but, like, to see the look on, like, Neil, who runs Steadicam, like, sending that picture to his mom with him holding the Golden Globe. Like, that, 
the positivity of it, you don't feel like, ha ha, fuck you, Lily Tomlin. Like, you're not, it's, you're so overwhelmed with the positivity of it. Um, there's definitely not like a, not like a fuck you triumph, especially because all of these awards nominations are subjective, you know? Um, and like everything else, you do an awards campaign. You know, I had a press conference with the Hollywood Foreign Press, so like, there is a certain amount of awards campaigning you do, but I was just so happy for what the award represented. There was definitely no moment of like, bloodthirsty <laughs> glory in it. And, and I was so honored to be nominated with all those, all those people. And honestly, the day I got nominated felt like I won. I mean, that was such a surprise. Um, and I found out at 5 a.m. on three hours of sleep, feeling much like I do now. Um, and that whole day really felt like a second Golden Gloves. It was awesome. And it must be so great because, you know, you don't win without the help of everyone on the show. So you couldn't be your best without, you know, your co-stars and, and the cast and crew. And, and you made that clear. So kudos to you because other actresses would probably just be like, I won. I beat Meryl Streep. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, it, it's, and I think that also, look, I'm also, I'm the executive producer, so I'm their boss. And so there is somewhat also of like a mother hen thing <laughs> going on. Um, Especially with me and the other actors, like I feel like I want to take care of them and, and make them feel comfortable. So there is a certain, in a cool way, because I co-created the show and I'm an EP, there's an ownership that even when I win for acting, I see it as a win for the show because the show in many ways is synonymous with my acting performance. Um, and it's just, it's just really, it's really cool and I love everybody. <laughs> I don't love everybody, like I don't like love Hitler. <laughs> I love everybody who works on my show. And Hitler would never be hired for my show. <laughs> unless he was like really good at makeup. So let's talk Emmys. Emmys are coming up. Um, oh, they are? <laughs> I didn't know. Let's talk about it. Um, so do you go into like an award season thinking, oh my God, I need to get nominated. This needs to happen. Or is it more of just like, you know, like you were saying before, it's just, if it happens, that's amazing. Or is there something now that you've won a Golden Globe that you're like, it would be great to get an Emmy? Uh, it would be great to get an Emmy nomination, um, partially because it would be the first major Emmy nomination for the CW. And I would love to do that for them. And they are all so wonderful and so supportive of what my show is. That would be so great to be like an ambassador for them. Um, and yeah, it would be awesome to get an Emmy nomination. I mean, I'm at this point, I'm doing so much Emmy press because the, the, the TV Academy is a much wider voting audience than the Hollywood Foreign Press. The Hollywood Foreign Press is a group of 90 people. The TV Academy is much larger. It's 18,000 people, and I'm not sure how many people vote in the actor category. So there are a lot more events. And so, I mean, I've been doing pretty con constant Emmy press for the past couple months, and at a certain point, yeah, I... I want to get a nomination. I'm doing a lot of work. <laughs> um, it would be really cool. Obviously, look, at the end of the day, all I can do is do all this press. I have no control over it. Whatever happens, happens. If nothing else, the press has been a great way for me to continue to get the show out there and, and meet fans and meet more people. Um, but yeah, it would, be, it, would be really, it would be really cool. I'd be lying to say, yeah, of course I want an Emmy nomination. <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, you guys are the Emmy voters, right? So. Yeah. You guys are all the, this guy who does coke every day. He's a <laughs> Speaking of the guy who does coke every day, let's, open, a microphone. It let's open it up to these crazy wild kids for some questions. Crazy kids. So um, my really good friend Brandon couldn't be here today, but he is going to see you at Vulture Festival, so he's really psyched. He did have a question, though, but you yeah. already answered uh, what, about the first episode, if it was ever going to be seen, so... Uh, he's kind of bummed that I'm um, not going to see it. The, the one that didn't get uh, put out. What? <laughs> Probably because Showtime was a little yeah, racier. It, the, yeah. Look, our, the, sh the episode that was shown on CW show pilot is basically the same as the Showtime one. Okay. We didn't reshoot it. We, we, we shot certain scenes because we recast the role of Daryl Whitefeather because Michael McDonald, who was the original Daryl, his directing schedule was so busy he couldn't do the series. And now we have Pete Gardner, who's the greatest human being in, in the entire world. Um... Uh, but but it, it's actually pretty much the same. We didn't have to cut much. I mean, there are a couple of curse words that we just, uh, we went back into the dailies and re-edited. The only major thing we cut out is in the scene between Greg and Rebecca, and I've said this before, and I hope to release this scene online because I actually think it's a great scene. Uh, there's a scene where Greg and Rebecca are at a party, and in the CW pilot, uh, Rebecca, there's a kind of make-out interrogation where she's basically making out with 
Josh's best friend to get information about where he is, and she's kind of doing this weird thing where she puts her hand up his shirt. In the Showtime pilot, she gives him a hand job, and so it's a hand job interrogation scene where she's doing this. I, you don't see his dick or anything. Um, when we shot it, it was my hand was just doing that. Um, uh, but but it was like muscle memory where like my hand was like, oh, we're giving a hand job now. I'm like my other hand started to like caress phantom balls. Um, <laughs> Because my body was like, oh, we're doing this? All right. Um, uh, I've been with my husband for eight years. Um, <laughs> um, and so it's a handjob scene. And then, she st- and then she, when she finds out Josh has a girlfriend, she dips down to blow him and gives him, like, a crying blowjob. And then he stops her. And um, we obviously couldn't show that on the CW. We will release that scene. And the reason I miss that scene is because it... <laughs> the, the reason I like it is it sets up the fucked up power dynamic and struggle that is Greg and Rebecca, which is uh, she has all the power, even though he is sarcastic and kind of better than her and, you know, thinks she's crazy. At the end of the day, um, she completely always has the upper hand until, of course, the later part of the season where their power struggle switches. So I think that, you know, sex is such an interesting expression of power and I miss that scene because it's such a power struggle. It's not a sexy scene at all. Um, it's, 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 it's like a war scene. <laughs> um, so I miss that scene. But yeah. Definitely release that. I will. I want to see it. Yeah. And, and the topless uh, uh, scene you were talking about in the beginning with the heavy boobs, yeah. Oh yeah, I never filmed that, but I, I was never topless. Uh, there was, a, there was a, but there actually was in the beginning, you show me at a strip club and um, in the CW pilot, she's wearing a bra and panties, um, but, but in the Showtime, she was topless, and at one point, I'm literally playing the drums on her boobs, which she let me do. That was a good day. <laughs> oh, right here. What's up? Hello. Um, I saw that your Instagram handle is uh, Rachel Does Stuff. What stuff do you really do? Are you a comedian? <laughs> <laughs> what stuff do I do? Is that a rhetorical question, or do you want me to list every... Like, hobby I've ever had. Favorite thing you do? Um, this show? I write it. I executive produce it. I act in it. I write the music. I write the scripts for the music videos. I, um, I sit in the editing room. Uh, I approve a lot of the music cues. I do publicity. Um, I give uh, publicity ideas. I give marketing ideas. Um, I do Q&As. I get my hair and makeup done. And I get, clo- I get clothes put on me. It's the life. And I have a dog if you're on my Instagram. <laughs> but Rachel Does Stuff was always, uh, way before anything that was, I knew that would be like my sketch, gr- my one woman sketch group name, like Rachel Does Stuff. I like it. Thanks. We're going to take our final question from an online viewer. Great. So Natalie would like to know who would be some of your dream guest stars? We did have Leah Salonga, who is like, ugh, oh. the dream. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, anyone. I, look, and this is like dream guest stars. Th- these are not people we've locked down because we have not locked down anyone. But of course, like Carol Burnett, um, who I got to meet, and she's amazing. Um, I mean, look, Bette Midler, Bernadette Peters, Liza Minnelli. You know, um, I am a gay man at heart, so I'm listing basically any gay icon. Uh, RuPaul, um, uh, Stephen Sondheim. Um, Oh my God! Anyone on Broadway? Who else? Barbara Streisand. Maybe? Oh, oh I would die. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it! Of course, Barbara Streisand. Oh my God! I would die. Um, you know, just anything gay men like is a dream guest star on my show, basically. <laughs> well, we're looking for all those guest stars to show up in season two, and I can't wait to see how this love triangle. Um, comes about in season two because it did. Greg did leave off where he muttered the words "I love you," but he was too drunk to say them to your face. So what's what a tragic go on? man! Well, people ask me what team I'm on. My team, Josh, Team Greg. I'm Team Rebecca. Yeah. Whatever she wants. It's it's whatever she wants. It's not whatever she wants. It's whatever she actually needs. But the second she gets that. Show over, so, yeah. (laughs) Because who wants to watch a happy person just be happy, right? That's not what my show's about. Misery only. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. And watch Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Thank you.